Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the council meeting of the 19th of May 2020. Um, I'd like to begin the meeting by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and, um, and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And just for the purposes of the, of the record, I'll, um, the meeting was opened at 6.02pm. Um, so I'd like to just first of all see whether we have any apologies or whether all members of council are accounted for. I counted, there's eight plus you. Yes, okay, all members are accounted for. So it's a little bit slower to do that in Zoom than it is when everybody's sitting in the council chamber. Um, and also just to note that we do have a hybrid where we do have the CEO and myself in the council chamber this evening with the rest of the council members attending um, electronically via Zoom and staff members and participants. So thank you all for attending. Um, we will then go to public question time and receiving of public statements and I'll go to the manager of governance because I understand that we have received a number of questions and comments for this evening's meeting from members of the public. Through you, Mayor Cole, we have received quite a few questions and comments from the public. Is it okay if I share the screen? So I'll read them out, but if I share the screen as well, would that assist in elected members um, reviewing the questions and comments? You just lose their faces temporarily. That's fine. That's because um, when you just to, just for the people here at home or as the council members, when we're sharing the screen, the screen, we're losing all of your faces, but we're not voting on this item, so that's fine. Um, the first question we've received is from John Gartner of the Forest Park Croquet Club in Mount Lawley. Question one, please advise the cost of maintenance of Forest Park Reserve, for example, the reserve bounded by Walcott Street, Curtis Street and Harold Street in Highgate and excluding Forest Park Croquet Club by the City of Vincent for each of the financial years 2016-17, 2017-18 and 2018-19. In addition, the budget amount and year-to-date expenditure for the same reserve for the 2019-20 financial year. The second question is, please advise the income from the hiring of Forest Park Reserve, for example, the reserve bounded by Walcott Street, Curtis Street and Harold Street Highgate, and excluding Forest Park Croquet Club by the City of Vincent for each of the financial years 2016-17, 2017-18, 2018-19. In addition, the income to date for the same reserve for the 2019-20 financial year. The second comment we've received is from James Boyle of North Perth, which relates to apologies that should be 13 Mabel Street, which is item 9.2 in the agenda. With regards to order of business 9.2 and specifically comments on visual privacy, page 51, noting in the comments the 7.5 metre deemed to comply R codes are not met. In addition, I wish to make a clarification to the first bullet point at the bottom of page 51. The windows at 1.6 metres high in the two bedrooms are clear glass and in no way obscure. One, as mentioned, along the western facade of the proposed residence and an, an additional window not mentioned at the rear of my property facing north. Given the positioning of the proposed residence and the building height, specifically the outdoor living areas, these spaces will have direct viewing access to these rear bedrooms. Whilst, whilst I acknowledge the updated plans received by Council on the 1st of May 2020, including additional screening, there remains line of sight visibility to habitable rooms. I request that council carefully consider, Council's careful consideration on the element of visual privacy, which is at your discretion on this evening's order of business. The next questions and comments come from Andrew Main of North Perth. My submission relates to an online survey I created and distributed for comment in late 2019, early 2020. The survey sought views on a range of topics relating to the current and future use of the Beattie Park Reserve in North Perth. To my knowledge, there is no master plan to guide any future development or activities that could occur at the park. Without a plan, decisions about the use and development of the park are made without guiding principles and may not be aligned with the needs of all current and future users of the park. As such, the purpose of the survey was to gain an understanding of how people currently use the park and what changes they would like so it was more desirable for them. The results of the survey provide the city with some reliable information about resident and use of views 
and could assist the city with the preparation of a comprehensive master plan to guide future decision making. I, am, I was very pleased that approximately 50 households representing over 80 people completed the survey. There were nine questions and I provide you some of the key findings. The most popular activities that are currently undertaken by users are walking, running and riding, using the playground, walking the dog, playing with the ball, exercise equipment. Additional features, facilities or activities requested by respondents are shade trees, drinking fountains, larger playground table benches, gravel path around the perimeter, netball, basketball ring, bench seats and off lead dog exercise area. Support for community events and or organised sporting activities being held at the park. 30 out of the 44 respondents to this question supported community events being held. 18 of the 44 people supported organised sport. Nine of the 44 people did not support either type of activity. Earlier today, I emailed all elected members and the CEO a complete analysis of the survey results. I'm hoping that the city will use this information as a starting point to develop a master plan for Beatty Park Reserve and possibly one that also incorporates the nearby Smith Lake and Charles Berryard Reserve. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I believe that's um, all the questions. Apologies, I believe we've also received some questions from Dudley um, Meyer, but I don't have them here. If you can just give me one second. Um, I think I emailed them out, but I'll just get them up. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, we've also received these following comments from Dudley Ma of Highgate. In item 11.6, the budget review, why is administration proposing that interest earnings be redu reduced by 748,100 due to low interest rates offered when the final statement for the end of March, item 11.4, with a quarter of the year still to go, already shows interest earnings of 729,175? Second question, at the meeting of 7th of April, I asked if the city considered asking the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries to defer the payment of 558,000 in rental in incentive for 246 Vincent Street. I also asked, if not, why not? The response given does not answer my question and simply states that the incentive was mutually agreed. In fact, the response indicates that the lease has not been finalised finalised and this is backed up by the inclusion of a report on tonight's agenda, item 12.4, which seeks to correct the o mistake oversight in the previously approved conditions of the lease. Given that there is no indication that the initial incentives will actually be spent on the fit out of the building and will simply go to consolidated revenue, and given that all local governments may potentially have si significantly reduced incomes from non-rate sources next year, it would seem that the city may have grounds to request a deferral of all or parts of the incentive. Given that the lease has not been finalised, will the city approach the department about deferring some or all of the initial incentive? Um, third question, at the meeting of the 7th of, at the 7th of April council meeting, I asked who prepared the report for item 12.3, sale of land. The answer provided did not say who wrote the report. It simply stated that all reports are authorised by the CEO. Nearby local authorities such as Perth, Subiaco, Cambridge, Stirling and Victoria Park identify the report authors, with most giving the author's name as well as the position. I am of the opinion that the former practice of identifying a report's, or, report's author was an important part of encouraging accountability and pride in one's work by removing the lack of anonymity. The former inclusion of a specific authoriser also gave an indication that reports have been checked by a manager with technical knowledge and responsibility. So I ask who wrote the report for item 12.3 sale of land at the meeting of 7th of April and who wrote the report concerning the lease of 246 Vincent Street for the meeting of 11th of February 2020 item 12.4. Question four, the answer to question four I asked at the 5th of May COVID committee meeting relating to details of how the Leaderville Gardens Trust funds will be spent states the trust includes a requirement that the PBIs in question exist for the acquisition, provision, maintenance, management or extension of an existing housing, villages, flats, apartments or similar accommodation operated by the association or the purchase or construction of a similar type of facility for senior citizens within the town's boundaries. 
does the administration stand by that statement or was I given the wrong answer? And last question, what items were discussed or presented at the council workshop of 28th of April? Um, through you, Macol, that's all the public questions and statements we have received for tonight's meeting. Thank you very much, Manager of Governance. Um, also, just to note that um, there were, um, we have responses to previous public questions taken on notice. Those um, answers are recorded in the agenda. Um, so there to be um, to read and reviewed by those who have asked the question. We thank you for those questions. Um, we don't have any, uh, I'll just say item four applications of leave of absence. Do we have any council members seeking to make a request for leave of absence? No, okay, thank you. Moving on, item five, receiving of petitions, deputations and presentations. I believe we have none this evening. Um, item six, confirmation of minutes. Uh, this is to adopt the minutes of the Ordinary Council meeting of the 7th of April 2020. Could I please call for a mover and seconder to adopt the minutes? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Logan. All those in favour? I declare the minutes carried. Thank you. Um, announcements by the presiding member, item seven. I'd just like to comment that this has been another very um, busy period for the City of Vincent whilst uh, we are implementing phase two of the State Government's roadmap to recovery. Uh, has been um, action stations here at the City of Vincent and we're very pleased to report that in the short space of time we have seen a lot of those changes implemented this week. On Monday, yesterday, our library and local history centre has reopened to our community. We've seen our sporting groups begin to return to non-contact training with support from the city. Um, and we are also reopening Beatty Park this Thursday. A lot of these changes require um, some very significant changes in operations in terms of, for example, Beatty Park requiring a booking system, requiring very detailed um, protocols to be put in place. Uh, it's great to see these facilities opening up, but noting that some of the protocols are still very high level in terms of public safety and what does need to be satisfied in terms of restricting numbers, ensuring that four square metre distances are maintained, and for example, not being able to open up change rooms at Beatty Park. So we have been able to achieve a situation where we only have 60 people coming back into the centre because we're lucky to have three separate entrance points. Um, always saying to people, please come prepared with your bathers underneath, ready to go. Um, in rural counties, toilet facilities, change rooms still off limits for now. So it's, um, it's pretty exciting. And I think that because we've been through that process of winding back, we are now winding forward again. And our staff have just become really brilliant at going with the flow and making these things happen really quickly and having a lot of really good strong will about getting that those things happen on the ground. Also been a lot of on-ground support for our local businesses as they also embark on these changes where we're now seeing dining um, for our food and beverage businesses again. Uh, as you can see, we've closed Leadable Village Square and we're trying to encourage businesses to come into that square and make the most of that for our fresco dining. And our um, health officers have been out on the street and on the ground, giving a lot of support to local businesses about all of the new measures that are coming into place. So it's been a really big effort and, um, you know, we have staff working over weekends, et cetera, just to get these changes implemented as quickly as possible. And it's just fully supported by the City of Vincent with a lot of great work happening behind the scenes. Also just wanted to note that it is Volunteers um, Week and just wanted to say an enormous thank you to all of the volunteers in our City of Vincent community. They are the people that bring a lot of heart and soul to our community and really make us tick. And when you see people like our sporting club volunteers going to great lengths to get um, kids and adults alike back out and training and to have that sort of sense of wellbeing and community connection happening again. Um, but a lot of um, support that has been called for volunteers during the time of COVID-19, what we've seen is because WA has been very fortunate and that our public health response has been great. Very nice, Council Patakis. Um, we've seen the, um, the supply of volunteers well and truly 
outstrip the demand and I think that's absolutely testament to our community and their willingness to really help their neighbours and get out and support one another. So that's been one of the silver linings I think of this situation that we've seen this enormous swell of, um, of people coming forward wanting to help and volunteer and put themselves out there to support people that are vulnerable. So um, thank you so much to volunteers who bring so much to our community and, and you're a huge part of, um, of our community connection in Vincent. Um, I'm now going to the CEO for Declaration of Interest. Of minutes. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I might just see if the manager could share screen again the previous declarations of interest received uh, for the briefing session last week. There in the Uh, through you, Cole, received a impartiality declaration of interest from Councillor Fatakis in relation to item 17.1, amendment to design review panel terms of reference and appointment of the design review panel. The extent of the interest being that Councillor Fatakis served on the City of Vincent's Art Advisory Group with one of the applicants. Uh, the second is from Councillor Sally Smith, um, a declaration of impartiality in relation to item 17.1 on the minor amendment to design review panel terms of reference and appointment of design review panel. The extent of the interest being that Councillor Smith knows one of the panellists on the design review panel from the Mount Hawthorne hub. The third is from Councillor Gondoszewski in impartiality interest in relation to item 17.1 minor amendment to design review panel terms of reference and appointment of design review panel. The extent of the Interest being that Councillor Gondoszewski is friends with one of the applicants for the DRP. The fourth declaration of interest is from Councillor Toppelberg. So financial interest in relation to item 12.4, lease of 246 Vincent Street, leadable to the Minister for Works, Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries, amendment to incentive condition item. The extended interest being that representatives of Councillor Toppelberg's company have engaged with the city in relation to potential upgrade works for the property at 246 Vincent Street, Leadable. That's all, Mayor Cole. Thank you, CEO. Um, just in terms of the public questions received this evening, items that were relevant, um, matters that were relevant to items on the agenda this evening, we've had questions raised about 9.2. Um, 11.6, which is an absolute majority decision required, and 12.2. Um, so I also just want to ask council members if there are items that you wish to bring forward for discussion. So I'm um, sorry, I'll go, I'll name you because I think we all appear in different order. Um, I'll try to go if we normally lose. So Councillor Hallett, do you have any items you wish to raise? 12.5. Uh, Um, Councillor Castle? Uh, no, I don't, but you, your um, sound is very quiet, Mayor. I'm just wondering if there's a way we could go yeah. up a bit. <laughs> I'll move it over here and then when um, the CEO needs to speak, I'll move it back over to David. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Thanks. Sharing a microphone, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, at a physically distant, safe way. Um, so no question, no items to bring forward, Councillor Castle, okay. Um, Councillor Wallace? Uh, no, not for me. Thanks, Mayor Cole. Um, then I think we go, is it Councillor Loden after that? Uh, just 10.2, please. 10.2. Uh, Councillor Toppelberg? Thank you, Mayor Cole. Uh, 9.2, uh, and I will actually bring 17.1. I know you spoke about earlier, but uh, so 17.1 and 12.2, we have to nominate as far as I'm aware. Yes, we do, thank you. Okay, Councillor Smith. No, thank you. Okay, and Councillor Gondoshevsky. 9.1, please. Was that 9.1? Yes. 
That was the one I wanted too, so thank you. Did I miss you, Councillor Fatakis? No, I'm fine, Mayor. Thank you. I'm trying to recall the um, way that you sit in the chamber, but there's a huge screen in front. <laughs> That's so, fine. Fine. Thank you, Mayor. Always very memorable. Please don't be um, offended. Um, okay, so I'll just go to the CEO and we can just discuss the items that will be moved on block. Yep. Through you, Mayor Cole, and unless there are any other indications from council members, I'll just read out the item numbers that are being proposed to be moved on block by council, which includes items 10.1, item 10.3, item 11.2, item 11.3, item 11.4, item 11.5, item 12.1, item 12.3, and item 12.7. And I'll just check if the manager's got that. Yes. Thank you, CEO. Could I please move for uh, um, council members to move and second the on block items? Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Fatakis. All those in favour? Yes, thank you, nine hands in the air. That's, um, those motions are passed. And just to note that an item 11.1 .1 has been withdrawn by administration, so that's no longer, um, that hasn't been moved on block and that's not being debated this evening, it's been withdrawn. Okay, so I'll go to um, the items that were raised by um, members of the virtual public gallery first. So the first item that was raised was 9.2. Number 13, Mabel Street, North Perth, proposed single dwelling. Could I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Moved, Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded um, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I guess I was waiting for someone else potentially to move this item. I've been somewhat conflicted on this one um, and we'll happily listen to the debate. Um, I, think I'm, um, I think I'm there though. I think that the design has taken um, uh, a journey, which I appreciate. And I think it's to the, uh, to, it brings um, the betterment of the design and the streetscape. Um, I'm challenged by the garage width and um, on narrow blocks, the decision to, um, both dominate the streetscape with a, a, a garage, but also to reduce the amount of landscaping able to be um, implemented within a front setback area to soften uh, the built form of the street. Um, but uh, I think ultimately that the case has been made for this design, given the constraints of the site and also the context in which it sits. So I am supportive of the officer recommendation at this stage, but we'll definitely listen to the debate of my fellow councillors, um, keen to hear what they have to say. Thank you, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Colt. Um, can we just get a response to the question that was asked from uh, the public in relation to the uh, 7.5 metres and also the visibility into habitable rooms of the neighbours, please. 
three email call, uh, manager of development and sign here uh, responding. Uh, the query relates to the departure sort to um, visual privacy, cone of vision setback requirements to so that Western um, boundary. Uh, that is captured in the officer report and correctly identified by uh, the resident. So a departure is being sought um, to clarify. Uh, it refers, the departure being sought refers to um, the upper floor where there is a balcony. Uh, you will see it on the uh, Western Elevation Plan uh, that there is privacy screening which extends forward of that balcony to the rear um, uh, in itself restricting that cone of vision to that ad uh, adjacent property uh, which is number 14 uh, Nova Lane. So on 14 Nova Lane to the rear of that property they've got an outdoor living area which is partially covered. Um, they will also have a boundary wall um, to the ground level and then they have four windows on the upper level to the east facade. Um, and I guess those uh, windows are either obscure or above 1.6 metres. And I guess that was the reference that was um, identified in the officer, officer report. Um, ultimately, they are not impacted um, by virtue of the balcony um, being provided with screening to the rear of the subject site. I hope that clarifies the, the query. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have any further comments. Thanks. Council members. Um, well, perhaps I'll just, um, for the public record, I did ask a question of the manager of development and design around um, the garage width and the fact that we have um, got an amendment um, afoot to our built form policy on um, garage widths where lots are less than 10 metres wide and I did seek some advice on um, whilst I don't think we're in a position to consider this seriously entertained um, how that would be treated if it was in place because I think that we do need to to talk that through given that um, that you know the council has taken um, strong positions on um, double garages on narrow lots. So, manager, can I just ask you to outline the advice that you provided to me by email just for the public record? Sure, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, the response I provided to you uh, was ultimately was speculative in terms of whether uh, what would be the assessment approach um, and what would be the outcome uh, if the built form policy that is currently um, in a draft form, uh, an amendment that is being proposed, it's gone out to consultation, uh, what would be the case if that was in effect um, and the implication for this particular application? So what I do confirm to you is that uh, there is a provision that has been drafted uh, to be included in that uh, amended built form policy that, that uh, states as a deemed to comply standard that for lots less than 10 metres wide, garages uh, are to be a maximum of four meters in its width okay so if if that provision um, was a due regard matter um, by virtue of the built form policy as amended having been adopted by council following community consultation which currently has not occurred but if that was the case uh, then that provision would ha ultimately have an impact on the deemed to comply assessment of the proposed um, double garage because the uh, garage as proposed, um, including its supporting structures, uh, occupy a width of 6.2 metres. So that would exceed the deemed to comply standard of four metres um, that's currently in the draft uh, amended built form policy. So uh, if that were the case, then a performance based assessment would need to be undertaken, um, having regard for the streetscape setting and the character of the area. Um, not dissimilar to commentary included in the officer report. As it currently stands, there's a section around the streetscape and the character. Um, so again, similar considerations, uh, but ultimately uh, there would be a specific deemed to comply standard that would not be um, satisfied if the draft amended uh, built form policy was in fact in place. Yep. Thank you very much, manager. So look, I have considered that because I think that's, a, that's where we are wanting to head, that we are wanting to, 
to move away from this situation where we do have narrow lots with double garages where they do dominate. And as Councillor Gontoshevsky points out, with a double width um, driveway, it means that you're really starting to significantly impact on the amount of landscaping that you can also provide. So I have, I have, con and, I, and I understand that this is not yet seriously even seriously entertained, and it's so it's not a due regard provision at the moment. Um, but I think it was worth at least talking about the fact that that is the intent of this council is to advertise that and to um, have that considered by the community and for that to come back to council for further consideration and possible inclusion in our built form policy. Um, but this, and then in relation to the actual site for constraints, this is a very difficult lot and um, the manager also provided me information about the fact that a tandem garage would just simply not be possible in this situation because of the um, decline in the site. Um, and also I've taken into consideration the streetscape on Mabel Street, which is very mixed and we do have a series of very narrow lots. We do have very um, different architectural styles and quite a lot of um, double garage doors um, presenting to the street. So um, I think I have in my head where I'd like us to be, but we're not quite there yet. And in terms of actually assessing this application under our current built form policy, um, taking into consideration the streetscape, also pleased to see that those um, windows to the um, front elevation are clear glazing and that that has now been conditioned. Um, on, those, on that basis, I will support this application. Any further comments or questions? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? So that's eight voting in favour and Councillor Toppelberg voting against. Thank you. Okay, the next item raised um, during virtual public question time was 11.6, the May Budget Review 2019-20. COVID-19, this is an absolute majority decision. Could I have a mover and seconder, please? I would if I could. Move Councillor Gontoshevsky, seconded Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, it seems like both an eternity and no time at all since we were looking at our, our budget review in um, March. Um, and uh, as a result of further investigation of the position and um, some more certainty over direction, um, there have been some, um, a, uh, the uh, changes since the mid-year um, review. Um, I am supportive of uh, the position that we have landed on um, and of the um, work undertaken by the um, finance team in relation to getting to this point in that um, constant state of flux that we've found ourselves in. Um, I did wonder whether it was worth, given that this is a, um, there has been some amendments since our March, um, uh, since the March uh, consideration, just to get um, a high level overview of where some of those changes have occurred through our executive director of um, community and business. Um, but yeah, look, overall, I'm supportive of this item. The other option is I was going to speak to it. So um... well, I, would, I would love to hear you speak to it. So I don't have anything to say. I'm fine for this one. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll go to the seconder, Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Um, yeah, happy to support this. Um, perhaps if we could also get a response um, from Mr. Meyer's question um, in relation to the interest um, he referred to. Um, and also just to acknowledge that, you know, it's a, we're making some difficult decisions, um, but also the finance team has done a remarkable job in a very difficult um, <laughs> um, time for everyone. Um, and, and thank you to them for all of the work that they've put into um, our response more broadly as well. Director, would you like to go to the question on the interest? Uh, yeah, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, the interest earnings, Mr Meyer is correct that in the year to date, it's down by about 6%. So it actually looks like it's tracking quite well. 
but it's made up of two um, key components. The first is our interest that we earn on our investment portfolio. And then the other part is our interest that we earn, um, that we uh, effectively charge um, uh, people who have a debt or an outstanding payment with us or who are on a repayment plan through their rates. So if you look at the first part of that, the, um, invest, the interest that we've earned on our investments, which are included in the report 11.3, um, you can actually see that the, at the end of the third quarter, um, our investment, our interest earned on investments was down by 50%, which is $165,000. And that is projected to stay at very low level and uh, to, um, that we're expecting that the budget variation on that is going to be about $300,000 by the end of the year. So that component alone um, uh, represents a large part of the variance that is mentioned. And then the other part of our interest earnings is, uh, as I mentioned, the interest that we charge on outstanding amounts. And in the um, final quarter of the year, we have actually waived um, much of that interest earned. So um, we've got one part that is tracking at 50% of normal levels, and then we've got another part that is being waived and is effectively zero. So um, that is the, the reason for the dramatic um, uh, variance on that particular item. Thank you very much, Director. Um, councillors, does anyone wish to speak to the item? Okay. Look, I'll just give a little bit of a, an overview um, of, of where we've landed because this has been quite a dramatic overhaul of the budget in light of the COVID-19 situation, which has had um, a significant impact on the City of Vincent's budget. So just for this last quarter, um, we have seen some significant impacts in terms of our um, loss of revenue. So $4.1 million in lost revenue, including um, almost $2 million of that coming through the closure of Beatty Park Reserve, uh, sorry, Beatty Park Leisure Centre. Um, and the impact of our very empty car parks and loss of events where we do see um, quite significant parking happening. So our parking revenue has fallen by 1.6 million. So they're two of the key um, attributing factors to the, the loss in revenue. Uh, we are really focusing on hardship provisions for our community and tenants. And at the COVID subcommittee, we've been dealing with, um, with waivers and deferrals for our city tenants. Our category one and two tenants got a, a waiver outright and where we've had our more commercial tenants in category three, we're now dealing with those on a case by case basis. And they, uh, many of those have been significantly impacted. And so our, our rental streams are also significantly impacted as a result, which we absolutely understand and, and are supporting um, our, our tenants with. Um, we are also looking at um, how we have really tried to deal with the fact that we've had that massive loss in revenue. We then had to restrict non-essential programs and expenditure and identifying savings wherever possible. So we have seen a reduction in operating expenditure of 3.2 million and our capital works has been reduced by 2.08 million. Um, we are carrying forward to next year's financial budget 1.2 million to go into the asset sustainability reserve and the intention is to spend that next year to ensure that our capital works program is happening because we know that's an important part of economic stimulus and we want to meet our, um, our responsibility in that regard too. So there's been a very big shift in terms of maintaining quality core services shifting our focus to the most vulnerable in our communities, um, in our community support for local business and also maintaining employment and redeployment um, for our staff. And that has been challenging for local government where we are not eligible for the JobKeeper payment. So where we have had um, lots of casuals at Beatty Park, we've tried to support them with special leave provisions. Um, that has been impossible to maintain our full casual workforce and seek to balance a budget for the for this year. Um, but we are really excited that Beatty Park is starting to reopen and hope to really engage um, those casual staff while we have been able to fully support our permanent staff and, um, and keep them employed with the city. Um, 
We're trying to make the best use of our purpose specific reserves. So you've seen our initiative around leadable gardens where we're releasing up to a million dollars to support the most vulnerable in our community. And we've, we've seen approximately half of that go towards homeless, so homelessness services, domestic violence, support for seniors and, and vulnerable in our community. And we also have our arts relief grants out there, which um, we're using our developer um, contributions for Pet Cent for Art. Uh, we are bringing forward maintenance works and we have been trying to make the most of buildings being closed in terms of Beatty Park. There's been a flurry of activity in terms of painting new ceiling over the, uh, the, the slides, etc. So that that work has has been happening around maintenance. We've seen extra maintenance happening at our reserves, etc. To try to make the most of this, this pause to while well, those buildings are closed. Um, and we will continue to do that. The, um, the maintenance works and the continuation of that has also provided some opportunities to really keep staff redeployed and busy. Um, we are ending up, um, where we end up is a, is a very minor projected deficit of $6,604. So I think that is quite, um, quite an achievement to get to that. Um, when we started out, we weren't sure whether we would be looking at a significant deficit, but we've really been able to wind back and reprioritise. And I think that um, as we go forth next year with our 2021 budget, we're going to have to start from a place of um, austerity. And then as our revenue streams start to come back on track, we'll be, we'll be going through regular view, reviews of our budget as those income streams come back and we're also going to be having a, a big focus on hardship provisions and capacity for people to make payments around rates etc so um, so pretty significant just for one quarter and some of these things will then carry over into our 2021 budget which we're hoping to um, to put out for comment and adopt um, next month um, director of community and business did you have anything that you wish to add Thanks, Mayor Call. I don't think I have anything to add. I think you've summed it up beautifully. Thank you. Council members, any further comments or questions? Okay, I'll put it. We are voting on the uh, May budget review and absolute majority decision. All those in favour? Nine hands in the air. Thank you very much. Adopted. Okay, um, the next item that was raised during public question time 12.4, lease of four, um, 246 Vincent Street leadable to the Minister for Works, Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries, amendment to incentive condition. Can I have a mover and seconder please? Oh yes, yeah, sorry, just to note that Councillor Toppelberg has declared a financial interest in this matter and has, um, has um, Left, left the chamber, the virtual chamber. <laughs> Can I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Moved, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Seconded, Councillor Hallett. I'm supportive of the officer recommendation. Um, this has been a long road, but that's it. Councillor Hallett. Um, similarly, <laughs> it would be nice to get this um, concluded and uh, support the recommendation. Councillors, any comments or questions? Okay, I'll just add to that to say that has been incredibly uh, gruelling negotiation process. And um, we've come down to this $25,000 and I have asked the CEO if, uh, if this is absolutely necessary and he assures me it is and that um, that the priority is to have a long-term tenant in the building for 10 years at a time when we are seeing um, a lot of vacancies and even more so now than when we were initially going through this negotiation process. So painful as it, as it has been, um, I do support the officer recommendation. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it, all those in favour? Eight hands in the air with Councillor um, Toppelberg not participating, so that is carried, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, they were the items that were mentioned during public question time. So we'll now go to the beginning of the agenda and work through sequentially the items that we haven't yet um, dealt with. So I'll go back to item 9.1, amendment number six to local planning scheme number two, and amendment number one to local planning policy number 7.4.5, temporary accommodation. Could I have a mover and seconder, please? Move, Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, look, I have a couple of questions in relation to this item and then a small amendment that I'd like to put forward. Um, but I think up front, I want to say that I think that this is um, uh, a really good starting point to a discussion or, you know, launching off point to go out to advertising to the community in relation to changes to um, uh, local planning scheme and local planning policy. Um, the city has, um, I think, landed um, in a, a pretty good space in terms of um, uh, addressing a number of the issues that are faced um, and are brought forward to both uh, elected representatives but also to our administration regularly in relation to short-term accommodation, but also acknowledging the um, disruptive nature of um, the changes in this industry and that um, they're not going away anytime soon. Um, and also that um, in a well-managed way, um, short-term accommodation can um, increase um, the people visiting our town centres um, and provide accommodation opportunities um, close to the city um, because of Vincent's unique placement as a community. Um, so uh, I think that I think this is a really, I'm very happy that this has come forward. This has been something that we've actually been asking for for some time and I'm really pleased to see um, that we're at the point of going to, uh, to the public with this. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, the first one relates to um, parking in the um, short-term accommodation that doesn't require development approval. Um, specifically um, holiday house um, accommodation um, where the, um, well, no, I guess all of the things that where the development approval is not required, um, just in terms of um, if there's no development approval required and the um, owner of the accommodation um, is currently eligible for residential parking permits, how does that play out if you have um, uh, additional people coming into the property? Um, are there, is it considered that the um, guests of the short-term accommodation are eligible to use the residential parking permits during their stay? I'm just wondering if I could get some commentary on that. Yes. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, so under the local law, there is nothing prohibiting... Um, an owner of a residential property who receives their parking permits from then providing those parking permits to, um, to short-term accommodation guests. So under the local laws, currently no restriction um, in that. We did consider trying to use this policy to create that restriction or not create that restriction or, or deal with that issue somehow. Um, but the low but that policy change wouldn't have an impact on the local law provision because they are separate pieces of legislation. So, um, yeah, in, in short, the local law allows that to occur. So can I just confirm then that even if this policy was to contain a provision, for example, in section 2.1, if an, a, an item was added to that to say that residential parking permits may not be utilised by short-term accommodation guests, um, that it's your assessment that because the local law doesn't prohibit that um, from occurring, that the policy is somehow void? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. It wouldn't be, the policy wouldn't be void. Uh, it become, it could be potentially built into the exemptions and it could then be potentially built into conditions of approval. Um, the exemptions are probably, it's probably easier to do that because and the reason I say that is because if you try to build it into, a, in a, into an approval, a, a development approval, you would have to have, you'd have, to have merit to that, um, 
to that provision, um, and i.e., you would have to um, it would have to be on the basis that uh, guests using parking permits was causing an amenity issue or a parking issue in the area. Given the number of parking permits is the same for all residential properties, whether they are short-term accommodation or not, it would be very difficult to argue um, generally across the board that in every case, um, guests of short-term accommodation using parking permits creates a parking issue when the same number are issued to a, a single house uh, that doesn't have temporary accommodation. So that was the reason we didn't include it in the policy in that sense. It could be built into the exemptions because then it would be a matter of assessing that development application to determine if there are um, you know, good reasons for parking permits to be permitted. So, um, but we didn't, we didn't include that in the provisions. We simply required the exemptions. We just simply required the management plan to comply with the car parking standards i.e. there's enough parking on site in accordance with our policy. So can I just get some clarification on that? Because if in the circumstance related to the, um, where the holiday house and accommodation is used um, just for the maximum of three months in one calendar year, um, in that, I, I guess my understanding is that in relation to the other items um, there that uh, that where we're issuing an approval that the car parking um, policy applies and that the parking management plan would generally be required, um, but that the um, exemption from, from approval for that particular um, use wouldn't, wouldn't, I guess, push it over into that sort of, um, I'm using the wrong word, but like, I guess, commercial use or a different land use. So it would still be considered a residential land use. Is, and so therefore the, um, the provisions around the parking management and the um, our policy in relation to I think it's policy 3.1.2 um, wouldn't apply. Is that correct? Uh, the, the decisions that have come out of SAP have stated that all short term accommodation are considered to be commercial uses. So even in that circumstance where it was being used just for three months of the year at most, um, it would still be considered a commercial use. And so those provisions would, would apply and they would need to develop a car parking management plan. Okay, thank you. Um, that was a bit long winded, but I'm really, I'm satisfied with that. Um, the other question I had was in relation to where it talks about um, separating the, um, the acceptable standards, where there's separation from the outdoor areas of the adjacent property. And I just wanted to check um, the rationale behind that and um, wondered if what we really are after is that the outdoor area of the adjacent property is perhaps not um, right next to the sleeping areas of their neighbours, which I think tends to be the cause of a few of the problems that we hear about in terms of short-term accommodation where someone's courtyard is right next to someone's um, bedroom and so house guests staying up late and enjoying, you know, conviviality is a problem for their neighbours. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, that is um, the intent. So it's separation from outdoor living areas to adjoining properties um, rather than between outdoor living areas. That wasn't the intent of that wording. Um, I don't, it may just be my reading of it, but that might need some tidying up. Okay, and the other thing was um, we've, def we've talked about family through the policy, um, like two guests or a family. Um, I presume that the definition of family would be up to two adults and dependent children rather than me, my husband, my sister-in-law, her husband, their three children and, you know, some other extended family. Is, is that the definition um, that we would potentially be applying when we're talking about family? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, the standard Oxford Dictionary definition would apply and that, I did look that up, <laughs> that is, uh, is uh, two or parents, so two parents, um, or one parent, and their direct, you know their direct children. So it's not extended family beyond that. Um, given that we're using the standard definition of the word, there would therefore be no need to specifically define it in the definition section of the policy. Would that be correct? That's correct. Um, 
we did consider that as well. Um, but because the, the term family is used in the scheme, in the regs, um, we considered it to be appropriate to continue to use it without a, a further definition, given the higher level of legislation doesn't define it. Thank you very much. Okay, so my last um, thing I wanted to talk about was the um, uh, was to put forward. Now, hold on, I did actually just briefly write myself some words. Um, I wanted to put forward an amendment um, to delete the words um, or a maximum of two guests with no host present from section 2.3a. Um, Maluka, I don't know if you want me to send that to you. Um, Through you, Mayor Cole, is that the amendment that um, has been prepared already? Because I have that. Oh, yes, I haven't seen that amendment. Sorry, my apologies. I didn't look at that. Through you, Mayor Cole, I I've just sent Maluka hopefully exactly those words. <laughs> Thank you. I did foreshadow it last week and then I completely forgot and then um, remembered it um, at about 5.30. So, yes, um, essentially, yes, that would be my intention if I can get a seconder, is to delete the um, maximum of two guests with no host present from section 2.3a. Um, sorry, Councillor Gondoshevsky, you're talking about that within the actual, one of the documents as opposed to the motion? That's correct. So it, I think it would, oh, I have to have a look at the wording that's been proposed. Have you got an agenda page number? Yes. The agenda page number is page 25, which is related to the exemption for development approval. And it is um, it, for holiday houses and holiday accommodation in a local centre, district centre, regional centre or commercial zone where, and section A currently states, there is a maximum of four guests or one family where a host is present, or a maximum of two guests or one family where no host is present. And my amendment would be, would propose to remove the words or a maximum of two guests or one family where no host is present. And I'll speak to it if I can get a seconder. So can I just clarify, so what your, um, what your proposition is, is it a holiday house and holiday accommodation in a local centre, district centre, regional centre or commercial zone should have a host present? Um, only where it is going to be considered exempt from requiring development approval. So if, there, if, if, a, uh, if you're going to have an, um, an apartment in a town centre, that is going to be a um, short-term accommodation use with no host present, um, that it should still have a development approval. That would be a D use um, and it would could be approved under delegated authority if it met the acceptable standards set out in the um, policy, but otherwise would require, we wouldn't be, it would not have um, unhosted, short-term accommodation um, would not be exempt from development approval. Okay. Um, so just in terms of the wording um, for the actual motion, have we got full, full wording about deleting this from this, from, um, from the policy? So we'll have to say delete, you know, the policy number 7.4.5 be amended at clause blah blah by you know deleting the words blah blah blah. Sorry. So I would say um, you add an item 4.4 that could say something like prior to advertising local planning policy 7.4.5 temporary accommodation is further amended to delete the words or a maximum of two guests with no host present from section 2.3.A. So. Yes, through, through you, Mayor Cole, it, it might even be easier just to add to the end of um, point three of the, re of the recommendation, subject to modifying proposed clause 3A to remove the words or a maximum of two guests or one family where no host is present. Okay. 
So does everybody understand that what this is effectively doing is saying that you still must have a host if you're in a local district or, or regional centre for to be exempt from planning approval? Is there a seconder for the amendment? So just, just for clarity, I'll, 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 yeah, that's right, I'll let it be seconded and then I'll I'll speak. second by Councillor Fatakis. Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Gondoshevsky? Yeah, look, I do. I think that this um, policy, um, as uh, written, um, as I said, is um, a great step forward in terms of both managing risk um, but um, and also supporting the benefits that short-term accommodation can bring to the city. I think that having a host in place is probably the greatest mitigating factor for risk that you can have for short-term accommodation um, that, from what I've observed. Um, and ultimately, the other thing is that where you've got a host in place and people coming into their properties, then, you know, that's extra people that can um, go out and um, buy coffee and have food and support our businesses, etc. cetera. Um, I think that um, we have a reasonable amount of accommodation within our local centres and district centres and um, an, a number of apartments that are going to come online to be built. Um, and I think that um, ultimately... Um, my position would be that um, that those apartments um, are there for at this you know for a residential purpose um, and that um, the risk of short term accommodation um, and I guess the risks are two potential you know that sort of community fabric etc where you have um, whole apartment buildings that do end up where you have a, a large proportion that are short-term accommodation um, and uh, the small number of residents that are then left living in those buildings I think you know experiences from Sydney and um, you know uh, some of the places um, in Sydney um, in the city has certainly shown that the residents that are left in those buildings um, do find a lot lack of community there um, and so I'd much rather just go out to um, consultation at this point in time with um, a perhaps slightly more cautious approach, uh, recognising that um, what this also does now is it says that, you know, if you're living in, a, in an apartment somewhere and or, you know, a home that you, when you're going travelling and you want to rent out while you're on holidays, that that gives you that ability to do so without development approval. But um, ongoing usage of a um, short-term accommodation without um, development approval um, and no host is um, not something that I'm um, supportive of at this time. Um, Tarkas. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I was glad to um, see um, Deputy Mayor Gondoshevsky raise this last week. Um, I was looking forward to the amendment. I knew it would come. Um, at some stage, um, but I'm very, very glad to see this because I think um, it just adds that little um, bit of layer on a change in a policy. I think we are, this is a big step forward for us. Um, it allows us to move into an area where, and um, I suppose that a lot of cities have grappled with of dealing with short-term accommodation, but it also means that um, with this amendment, we've We've got a little bit of a protection mechanism in there on community and like Councillor Gondoshevsky um, mentioned uh, the issue of community. Um, myself personally, having been involved in an, a wide range of uh, developments throughout the Perth inner city area, and we often talk about um, apartment buildings um, and townhouse developments and um, I suppose these multi-unit uh, multi dwellings um, and we're seeing an increased um, prevalence of those coming into our city. Um, those being a community within a community. And you see that very quickly get pulled apart um, as you've got a lot of that change in, in an apartment building where you've got a lot of short-term rentals coming through and people coming through um, in really quite massive changes. Um, and it very, very quickly can take away from what is a great community feel. But I think the other thing is to go back to where the core of a lot of our complaints and issues have been, and they have been in the unhosted area. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased to actually support this. I think it, it just really adds uh, another level of detail onto um, what is a, a, good, a policy that allows us to step forward into this area. Thank you, Councillor Fatakis. I've just seen the Manager of Governance raise her hand. Can I just check I've got the wording 
for this amendment, correct? Uh, by sharing it on the screen. Sure. Go ahead. I think that should be, I guess, two, uh, section two, clause three A, or I think that's what it is. Yeah. I think, isn't it? I think it is. Yes, yeah, so that's right. Section two, clause three A. Yes, that's fine. And apologies for not sending that through earlier. Okay, so it's been moved by Councillor Gontoszewski, seconded by Councillor Fatakas. Are there any comments in relation to this amendment? Um, I'm a little bit ambiguous, but I can understand the points that have been put forward. So I'm, I'm happy to go with it, but it is for advertising. So I was sort of open to testing this out, but I, I'm sort of convinced by what you've put forward. Uh, councillors, any comments? Okay, I'll put the amendment, all those in favour. That's nine hands in the air, that's carried. We're back to the substantive. Councillors, further comments? Can I just ask one question before I finish my bit? I just wanted to ask about consultation in relation to the advertising. Okay. Um, given we're in COVID, um, and this is um, uh, a challenging time, like this is quite a departure from our existing policy. Has there been any consideration of um, of how we might encourage increased engagement with the community in the online space for consultation on this item. Through Mayor Cole, in short, no, we haven't got to that point yet. Um, so that's something we'll need to do in the coming weeks and we'll need to um, obviously uh, advise council members of what we're proposing to do and seek any comments that you have on how to maximise that engagement. Um, I think. I think you're very, you're very right in to say that it's a, it's a significant change and we really need to gather um, the full spectrum of community views on this um, from, from those that currently operate um, temporary accommodation through to those that live next door to them. So um, we will be working on that once um, there's a decision on this matter. Thank you, nothing further from me. Thank you, I'll go to Councillor Toppelberg now. Thank you. Um, so that was in part my question, but I think how this is advertised is critical because it's not just advertising of a amend proposed amendment to policy. It's actually a community litmus test on what people feel in relation to th this sort of accommodation. It's not a chance for neighbours of bad experiences to vent their anger and stomp the street. And it's also not a chance for people to uh, take their investment portfolio and turn it into uh, an Airbnb extravaganza either. It's, it's basically uh, an opportunity for community discussion. I think that we need, uh, I won't bother with it by amendment, but I think it would be good to perhaps bring the consultation ideas to some sort of round table and get some feedback because we have to make sure that when we put our hands in the air for what will become the policy, that it's actually reflect, reflective of the community's views on short-term accommodation in the city. Um, I agree with Councillor Gondoshevsky. This is a, a first step into formalising and uh, there will be a lot of people um, that will look to this and say, it's what I'm already doing. It fits within what I'm doing. I'm happy to make it formal rather than going under the radar. And there'll be others who are fearful because they are not compliant and they're running businesses that are not compliant with this policy and will seek to have it pushed further. And there'll be people who live nearby or have had bad experiences who want to shut it all down uh, where possible. So I think... It, it's critical the, the the consultation has to be something more than an ad in the voice and on the city's website. We have to find another way to engage with it. So I'll leave it in the capable hands of uh, the team, but yeah, hope, hoping that we can have a discussion sometime before the 42 days commence. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillor Castle. 
Thank you, Matt Cole. Yes, um, I agree. I think on the consultation point that um, obviously, as we always do, we should be trying very hard to look for innovative ways to connect with the entire Vincent community. But I would also like to see some special consideration in, on how we'll engage with the areas that we already know there's high concentrations of short-term accommodation being town centres and the closer we get to the CBD. Um, so they might require some more targeted um, communication to ensure that they are actually part of this um, discussion. Um, I think also in that consultation, uh, my observation is it will be very important to point out the differences in what we're proposing here with these this amendment is that as we've just seen with the previous amendment to the recommendation, we're not necessarily talking about what will and won't be approved, but what process they'll have to go through. And um, that might need a bit of explanation to the community in terms of what um, doesn't require development approval, what has discretion, what is um, not at all allowed. Um, the example we just spoke about with unhosted two-person um, short-term accommodation may well be approved in some circumstances. Um, so it's really just making that clear that this is about the process that we would go to to determine that. Um, but I, otherwise I'm supportive of this and I look forward to seeing what the community has to say and how, um, how they feel about uh, these changes that we're proposing. Thank you, Councillor Castle. Any further comments? Um, look, I did just want to draw Council's attention to the change that's happened between the briefing and the Council meeting, and it was prompted by my inquiries, and I do thank the Administration for being very responsive to that. But I just did want to air this and to sort of perhaps discuss the time frame here. So since we looked at this at the briefing, um, it has now stated that for holiday house and holiday accommodation across all zones, um, you, you can be permitted to have a maximum of two guests or one family on one occasion in any 12 month period for a maximum of three consecutive months. And that's um, unhosted is my understanding. So when I read this, I was just a little bit unsure about the three month. I know it's up to three months and it's on one occasion. Does that mean um, if you, so this was really that discussion around if you decide to go on an overseas holiday one day when that's an option again and you wanted to allow your house or home or apartment to be used for short-term accommodation, should that be allowed where it's a sort of ad hoc arrangement for a short period within the year? Um, and I think that where this has landed is it's saying that, yes, that, that, that can, you know, that, that's something that would now be advertising to the community for their views. Um, and I just wanted to check, so when we're talking about on one occasion in any 12 month period for a maximum of three consecutive months, does that mean that you would be able to take one booking only and that that booking could be consecutive for up to three months or that for that one period of three months, you'd be able to take a number of different bookings of different, different um, families or two people coming unhosted to your home? Sorry, Mayor Cole, the proposal is for people only to be able to take one booking in a 12-month period. And that booking could be anywhere from you know, one day to three months, but one booking only in a 12-month period. And it's to accommodate the house sitting situation, which, which was never, it was never, you know, we weren't proposing to stop that. Um, the, the current policy and the previous scheme talked about, um, you know, temporary accommodation for um, where, where there was a profit being made, so for commercial gain. Um, and so previously, under the previous scheme, house sitting for free was exempt. Unfortunately, with the changes to the regulations, the changes to our scheme, um, that, that's no longer the case. You need, you need approval if you were going to propose a house sitting for free. Um, it was very difficult to split those two things out and given the, um, the approach people have with Airbnb, we thought it was appropriate to allow for house sitting to occur, whether it was paid or um, for benefit, i.e. when you do a house swap on Airbnb, or it was a relative coming in looking after your house for free. But for a maximum of um, 
or sorry, for only on one occasion in a 12 month period. It could be for longer because once it goes over three months, it's then considered to be a single house or a group dwelling and you don't need any approvals for that whatsoever. Okay, well, given that it's on that one occasion and it's one booking, I'm, I think that's really met what I was um, seeking um, from, from this process. And I think that as long as we explain, again, it all comes down to the communication. And I think if we explain in the communication that this is um, a situation where you have a homeowner that wants to have a house sitter, wants to take an overseas trip and have someone come and stay in their home, do a house swap, I think it's all about the language. So um, I'm, I'm happy with the fact that this is one, one booking within one period of time throughout a 12 month period um, to a maximum of three months. And I think it'd be very interesting to get the community's feedback on that. So thank you very much for that further explanation and for accommodating that in the um, draft policy for advertising. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Nine hands in the air. That motion is carried. Thank you, council members. Okay, the next item is 10.2, outcome of public consultation for Scarborough Beach Road, Main, Green, Brady Streets, proposed intersection modifications. Um, this was a uh, a late item and the reason it was quite so late is because we were on a very tight time frame from Main Roads WA in terms of meeting their deadline and wanting to um, maximise the amount of time that the community had to comment. So I do hope council members have had a chance to um, review the report. Um, can I call for a mover and seconder please? Move Councillor Castle, seconded Councillor Loden. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I appreciate the work that um, the administration have done to get this consultation done in what, as the Mayor said, is a very tight time frame. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, for, do we have the Director of, uh, what is it? Infrastructure and Environment? Yes, we do. Um, I just spotted him in the Brady Bunch grid. Um, I, I'm just wondering, we, we stated in the report that there was some specific targeting to residents in those streets that are most affected by this particular intersection. Do we have any information from the response or from the surveys as to um, what proportion of those residents responded? Uh, through you, Nicole, no, we don't. Um, the reason for the letter was to encourage them and to advise them that there was a consultation there, but. Um, the uh, replies, unless they actually stated their address in the comments, we couldn't pick them up separately. So we haven't got that information to hand. Okay, I can see in the report that a very high percentage of respondents lived um, within two kilometres. So that, I guess, gives us some information, but perhaps not quite as um, specific. I just wondered, I guess, for the benefit of the public record, if you could take us through what will happen now um, once this report is considered because this is probably not being conducted in the normal way that we would uh, consult with our community on a project like this. Yes, we're going to call. So uh, if Council approve the recommendation tonight, we uh, will immediately pass that recommendation uh, to Main Roads and we'll include uh, all the information from the consultation. So the, the summary that you have, but also any specific comments and uh, we will ask them then to deal with those comments uh, as they move through the next stage of design. So if you recollect the report talks about 5% design, they're going to move quite quickly to the next stage. So we'll ask them to take into account the comments that we received, you know, while moving to the uh, next stage of design. Uh, thank you. And it, is it my, uh, it's my understanding, I just want to check this is correct, that the next stage is 15% um, and there won't be another opportunity to comment on that level of detail for the community? Yeah, that's correct. So, you may call. so they'll move quite quickly to a higher percentage design than that, to 95 or 100%. They'll move very quickly from recollection. They are trying to get to um, a design completion in July. So 
uh, they might go through a 15% stage, but they wouldn't come back to us with comments for comments necessarily on that. So uh, would, are they likely to come back to council for comments uh, with the 95% design before it's completely signed off? So going to call it. They certainly will come back to administration because, you know, we are involved and they'll come back to us. It's up to council where they, you know, you want that level of detail to come back to you. That, that isn't difficult. Uh, and finally, I noticed that this, um, as we discussed in workshops, that this was also being put um, for consultation by the City of Stirling. I think their timeframes were very similar to ours. Do we know any details about the responses received um, through their community? McCall, no, we don't at this stage. They close on Friday, so they're a week. Uh, they, they're a week behind us, so, but we haven't got any feedback on the specifics of what the community is saying. What, what I can say is that uh, their consultation is exactly the same as ours, so they mirrored our consultation, so it was consistent. Thank you. Yes, I'm supportive of the, of the recommendation, and um, I think a lot of community members will be very happy to see this project progress. It's been discussed for a long time, um, and there's clearly a fairly high level of support in the community for the um, the plan that has been presented. So um, perhaps some tweaks might be needed, but it looks like um, that's fairly well accepted. So happy to see how this progresses. Thank you, Councillor Castle. Councillor Lowden. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a uh, quick question. I recognise this is early phase of the uh, uh, design at five percent, um, but do we have an opportunity to influence the uh, amount of um, canopy cover and vegetation that's used on the site? There is some included in the the concept, um, but there would appear to be some opportunities for increased um, greening around it. Particularly, there doesn't appear to be anything in the middle of the roundabout. I know there's some talk to that in the report, but um, are we able to somehow um, emphasise our interest to see more of that, if possible? Yes, McCall, we can certainly make that comment. It isn't a problem. Um, and ultimately, Yellow Main Roads will approve everything. Uh, those roads are under the care and control of the two local governments. So we do have some flexibility to be able to um, influence the final design you know, when it's actually constructed. So, yeah, we've got two opportunities. One, I think, is to make comments now, and one is uh, after the final design is approved to add some greening if we think that's appropriate and we can fit it in. Does that require a, an amendment to the recommendation from council or is that something that you can basically address separately, building on the commentary that's already provided back by the community? Yes, we, uh, we can certainly just do it based on uh, your feedback tonight. So we'll take that, um, that comment forward and build on what the public have said. That is no problem. And when are we likely to see the next uh, iteration come back to council? I think that's down to council. So if you look at the report, their intention, main roads, is to get to 100% design in July. So that would be the next opportunity, I think, formal opportunity to come back with a final design to council. And that would be for to a council meeting like this or through a workshop format? That's really my call. Uh, we'd probably follow the same format, bring it to a workshop first and then bring it to council if that was um, the appropriate thing to do. Thank you. Um, look, I'm happy to support this as well. I think um, there does, the, the community is broadly supportive. It's a shame we weren't able to um, allow a, a more full, fulsome um, community consultation, but that is the reality of what we're dealing with here. Um, and I live locally and I'm, I'm aware of this intersection. I do use it somewhat frequently um, and I recognise the frustrations that people would have with it. And I can see that this configuration will improve upon that situation, particularly for people coming from uh, down Green Street and also improve the safety there. I've seen um, a number of foolish manoeuvres by people um, across there that um, I haven't seen an accident yet, but um, I'm where they have been in the past, so I'm happy to support this recommendation. Thank you. Apologies, a nine-year-old thinks he has an emergency at home, but I've clarified it's actually not an emergency. <laughs> Um, sorry, so have you finished speaking, Councillor Loden? Yep. Are there any other comments in relation to this item? 
Um, Nicole, I will just quickly say, I do think that this has had a very good airing. So if you recall that we did have a forum with um, residents, which was very well attended. I think it was uh, even early December, if um, my memory serves me correctly. Um, there have also been two mail outs from the state member for Perth, John Carey, on this matter. And I do think that overall, even in terms of Facebook commentary that's been going, going around the various community pages and um, through the city's um, Facebook and um, member for Perth's Facebook, in addition to the survey, which I really appreciate people have taken the opportunity. I think overwhelmingly people are very positive about this project and they like the configuration that has, um, has where we've landed with this uh, roundabout configuration. It has changed in response to community feedback that was received. Um, and I think that people's comments are now going to that sort of finer grain in terms of the you know, canopy and the bike lanes and where, you know, where the sort of um, pedestrian crossings will exactly be situated. So I think that people seem to overwhelmingly support, and we've seen that through the survey, the, the road layout and configuration, and then those finer details in terms of that commentary that's been received, that's been really useful and that will also be provided to main roads and has been quite consistent in terms of the sort of feedback we got at the forum and through um, that I've been reading through various commentary through community pages, etc. So I feel very confident that the community is on board with this design. And I think that the results of the survey reflect the feedback that we've been receiving over the past few months on this. On So uh, very exciting that we're actually tackling this intersection um, and really excited that this project is actually going to happen. So fully support it. Um, any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Thank you. That's nine council members voting in favour. Okay, the next item that we're dealing with this evening is 12.2, nomination of elected members for the vacant local government position on the Central Perth Land Redevelopment Committee. Um, just to note that to date there have been two expressions of interest, um, one from Councillor Toppelberg and one from Councillor Gontoshevsky, and we can nominate up to three, but we don't have to nominate three. So um, I'll put this um, forward for a mover and seconder. Councillor Toppelberg, are you moving that or adjusting your camera? Moving, Councillor Toppelberg, seconding Councillor Hallett. Thank you, was doing both at that time, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, just, yeah, I'm, um, yeah, understood and uh, what, what's involved, happy to nominate and uh, I think Councillor Gontoshevsky would do an extraordinary job uh, should she be uh, successful in <laughs> getting, getting there ahead of me. So either way, happy that we'll be well represented. Good bit of healthy competition, never hurt anyone. Um, Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Strongly support us uh, putting forward some nominations and um, particularly um, support either of these folks to um, end up on the, on the panel. Councillors, any further nominations or comments? Okay, well, we'll unless there are any, any indications, this is a motion where we are recommending uh, Councillor Toppelberg and Councillor Gontoshevsky to go forward as um, potential representatives. So all those in favour? Sign hands, thank you, that's adopted unanimously. Uh, next item is 12.5, update on the city's advisory groups seeking nominations for community representatives. Moved by Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Castle. Thank you. Um, happy to support the report as is. I just wanted to pull it out just to make a couple of comments about, um, I guess, the importance of our advisory groups um, historically and the enormous contribution that um, these folks have made to our policy development, deliberation um, and the on the ground initiatives that end up um, going forward. Um, I did just want to comment on the um, both the UMAG Urban Mobility Advisory Group and the Environment Group, which were two groups that I've um, been most involved with and um, perhaps if anyone else wants to talk to other groups, 
um, encourage them to do so. Um, but I wanted to comment around the, the fact that these advisory groups did technically end um, in October last year. Um, and we faced the kind of interesting situation where we're wanting to review the, the way we consult and engage our community. Um, because obviously advisory groups are one way we can do that, but there's a range of other ways as well. And we wanted to make sure that we're um, optimizing the groups, both for um, the outcomes, but also for, for those that are involved in making sure that we're making the best use of um, the expertise that we have of the um, varied um, people on those groups that are within our community. Um, we've made the decision um, potentially tonight, if this passes, um, around merging um, two of the groups, which is environment and urban mobility. Um, and for me, that's, um, that's quite a, a useful way forward in terms of thinking the way about the way that we um, approach particularly some of our strategic plans within Vincent. Um, for me, combining the two means that there's a, a really cohesive kind of focus on the natural and physical environment and the networks within that. Um, and so to have um, that range of expertise in the one room and to have that single conversation um, across those domains is really important. Um, and yeah, I look forward to um, seeing the nominations come forward and, and also look forward to um, getting to the point where we have a um, new consultation policy and um, have some other ways forward for the way that we um, work with our community. Thank you, Councillor Hallett, very nicely put. Um, that was seconded by Councillor Castle. Thank you, Mako. I yes, I echo a lot of those comments. It's really good to see this item back on our agenda. We are, as Councillor Hallett said, we are still reviewing um, the way that we consult with our community and the way we can best use our community members um, to add to that expertise and to um, tap into their networks and um, and really get a broader view of what our community uh, wants and needs in these spaces. I think there's also a number of um, key plans that are coming up that will be really useful to touch base with these groups and to get their um, expertise and their feedback onto, onto what's happening in the, those spaces of arts, children and young people and sustainability and transport. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing some nominations come through. We might see some familiar faces and hopefully some new ones as well. So um, it's a great way to, to get a broad range of opinions as part of our decision making. So happy to support. Thank you, Councillor Castle. Are there any further comments on advisory groups? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Oh, unanimous. Thank you. That's passed. Um, that brings us to item 12.6, um, report and minutes of the audit committee meeting held on the 5th of May 2020. It is part of our process that this item does need to be brought forward by the chair of the um, audit committee. And we do have a, a community member as our chair, which we're very proud of. So I'll um, go to the deputy chair, Councillor Loden, to move this item, please. Oh, sorry, Councillor Toppleberg. Look at that. That's a wrap of the motion. I'm behind the times. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I think we'd be one of the only audit committees in, Vince, in uh, WA without the mayor on the audit committee too. So mm -hmm. I shall move the motion. That's because I have utter confidence. I wasn't, I was 100%. I think De it's extraordinarily positive. Kondrzewski is also on the audit committee and has seconded the motion. Um, did you wish to speak to it, Councillor Toppleberg? Uh, no, I think the report is relatively self-explanatory, so I'm happy to move as recommended. Councillor Gontoshevsky? No, I'm supportive of the officer's recommendation. Councillor Loden, as a, as a fellow member, wish to add anything at this point? No, okay. Unless there are any further comments, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Councillor Loden, I just can't see a hand. Yep, great. All unanimously supporting the motion, so that's passed. Thank you very much. Um, we do have one confidential item to deal with this evening, item 17.1. So we do have to go behind closed doors, so to speak. 
um, but we will resume an open meeting for the um, resulting motion to be read out. So I'll just um, ask Manager of Governance to put us into virtual confidential mode for this item, please. We'll need a mover and second to do so, I'd imagine, so I'm happy to move it. Councillor Toppelberg, and thank you, Councillor Hallett, seconding. All those in favour? I declare that carried. Um, thank you very much, everyone. We've just been dealing with confidential item 17.1, minor amendment of design review panel terms of reference and appointment of design review panel. And I can um, now read out the, um, the resolution of council, which is that council one adopts the draft amended design review panel terms of reference included as attachment one. Two, appoints the following applicants to the City's Design Review Panel until the 19th of May 2022. James Christo, Architect, Chairperson. Simon Venturi, Architect, Deputy Chairperson. Dominic Snellgrove, Architect. Joe Chin Darcy, Architect. Dr Anthony Duckworth-Smith, Urban Designer. Manira Mackay, Urban Designer. Tom Griffiths, Landscape Architect. Damien Pericles, Landscape Architect, Oliver Grimaldi, Sustainable Design, and Stephen Carrick, Heritage Architect. And three, notes that the design, the, sorry, notes that 3.1, the City's Design Review Panel members' terms expire on the 19th of May 2020. And 3.2, Administration will notify all applicants of the Design Review Panel appointments and induct the successful candidates into the design review panel. So that concludes the motion, but just to be clear, because we've made that announcement tonight, the intention is to inform all applicants tomorrow, as soon as possible, um, that on, on the outcome of that item. Um, so there being no further business this evening, um, I can now thank you all for your attendance. Oh, Councillor Fatakis has a hand in the air. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just want to clarify, I heard uh, 2020 rather than 2022 on that date. I just want to be clear on that. On that. Um, the date, three, Clause 3.1, the City's Design Review Panel members' terms expire on 19th of May 2022, for clarity. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Patakis. Um, so, there being no further business this evening, I can declare the meeting close at 7.53pm and thank you very much um, for your attendance and for those who have joined us on the live stream. Thank you and good night.